So, this is the second time I'm trying to do one of these. I'm not sure if I'm going to call this a podcast yet, or it's just a discussion amongst friends. It's me, Craig from NBS History, and I'm alongside with Eric, a friend you've probably seen in a previous video. He's a guy I went to school with, and he's a fellow historian. And my other buddy, Justin, who was in a video, he is a film lover, a history lover, and he's kind of here to be the layman. Welcome, guys. Hello. Nice to be here. Appreciate it. And the topic of this video is going to be about the historical accuracy or inaccuracy of a few films that we've selected. They are as follows. We decided Pocahontas, The Last Samurai, The Patriot, 300 Rise of an Empire, and uh, Black Hawk Down. So I guess we'll start with Pocahontas, which was made by Disney, as we all know, and revolves around a very well-told story that I think Americans would know more than us, because I'm just going to disclose that we're all Canadians here. And uh, how about, uh, Justin, what do you remember of this film, Pocahontas? Well... The thing with Pocahontas is it starts to describe earlier relations and uh, I'm going to say confrontations between, you know, settlers and Native Americans uh, and basically describes the love story of a settler with a Native American princess, I'm assuming. But I have a feeling there's a ton of issues with this movie because I really don't think that settlers and the natives tend to mingle on a romantic side uh, oh. throughout history. Actually, uh, I would argue on that. Very, they, they very much did. That was the foundation of a lot of the settle- early settling was done. So, yeah. yeah. What I would say it would be more of a consensual basis. Was there consent in this romantic relationships? Is Oh, a- consent was given. It's just they didn't speak the same language. <laughs> oh, I see. That's that's not good. I'm making a joke, of course. Uh, Eric, I know you have at least some Aboriginal history under your belt. What would you like to say? I, well, I mean, I haven't seen this movie in a very, very long time. I can just speak from what I remember, and I do know it did portray a more European dominance in this time period, whereas... They were needed by the natives there, and they were more, um, how, how would you say, necessary in this time period. Yeah, so Which, of course, contradicts historical evidence in that time period. T- t- I know between all of us, I think with my my background, I did do quite a lot more um, Abor- Aboriginal history, and I do happen to work on a native reserve, so I guess. I'm going to be the one to kind of dwell into the actual story. Uh, the only way to really talk about this movie is to give a brief summarization of the story of Pocahontas, which I imagine actually quite a lot of Americans probably are familiar with because it is something that's taught quite often. However, the story that's taught has a lot of contradictions because it was told by multiple sides and a lot of folklore and myth got involved. So. I'll try and summarize it and dwell a little bit in there. But let's look at uh, one of our prominent characters, John Smith. Now, before the events in question, John Smith is actually what I would describe as a James Bond-like character of his day. He fought Ottoman pirates and corsairs, went on all sorts of adventures. And uh, there's this crazy story of how, I believe, a sultan in present-day will be Turkey imprisoned him and the only way that john smith got out was he seduced this one of the sultan's wives got her to get him out of his cage and then ran for his life so he's one of the few americans that actually escaped uh, ottoman imprisonment of christians which is a whole other topic we can talk about i guess later but anyways he ends up on this voyage to uh, the jamestown And he's uh, arrested while on the boat. And for about a month's period while in Jamestown, he's still under arrest. So after a month, he wants to do an expedition. And that's kind of where the movie shows us him 
interacting with Pocahontas, but there's a ton of backstory about the uh, the Jamestown colony. While they were setting up, they were treated somewhat like a tribe, and they had trading relations with uh, the Pohantans. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and uh, other tribes. Unfortunately, they were also known as a bunch of freeloaders because they couldn't live off the land, they didn't know how, and they built their settlement on a marsh. And you can't grow anything on a marsh. And almost all the other tribes were actually making nicknames about them being these idiots who just simply didn't know how to live off the land. Yes, I I do remember hearing that from our Aboriginal classes about how the natives looked down upon the Europeans for choosing that area to settle in. Yeah. And so because they were freeloading, they were trying to trade for corn with nothing, basically. This eventually aggravated the natives, predominantly uh, Chief Poatin, who had a very loose dominance over quite a few tribes because he took a wife from each tribe as his own. And then he had this really unique situation where he's a harem and he was the one male figure that controlled all of this through this harem. What a lucky guy, mind you. And uh, he was losing control while all this was going down because some of the tribes were, you know, they were fighting for more power and control. So he wanted to establish a relation with the Europeans because he saw that as a better situation, maybe to get firearms and more power. And uh, I read into the literature, some Spaniards apparently had antagonized the region at some point, which I find surprising given where it's located. And uh, he was afraid, like most of the other natives that knew of them, of them coming around and, I guess, killing everyone and enslaving them. So he sought to have a better relation with the people of Jamestown, which isn't exactly the story you're always going to hear, especially from Americans. So we hear that John Smith goes on an expedition and he's captured. John Smith tells us that for quite a few days, they had uh, negotiations for trade and, you know, things were going pretty well. Unfortunately, and this is where Pocahontas comes into it, mind you, I'll acknowledge that Pocahontas is one of the daughters of one of the wives of the chief, and she allegedly was his favorite, and at the time was 10 years old when she met John Smith, mind you, which is super creepy when you think about this movie. John Smith eventually gets captured again, but this is after all relations have fallen apart with uh, Jamestown and the local natives. Natives want to kill them because everything's going horribly, and also... Chief Poanton's losing control of uh, his dominance. There is a ceremony, apparently in Algonquin culture, in which when you adopt someone into your family or your tribe, you have them put their head over a rock and you have a club as you're the authoritative figure. And it's kind of like a a fake drama of you uh, trying to kill them, but you're not going to. And then you acknowledge them and they're adopted into the family. Apparently, this is what was going on when we see Pocahontas throw herself over John Smith, saving his life, and that the truth behind it isn't that she was saving his life. It's just he didn't understand what was going on. But mind you, this is scholars talking. We don't have concrete proof of this. And in the movie, as you probably both see, we see this as, oh, she saves his life. And then there's this huge romance between... An 18-year-old woman in the Disney film, I hope, not a 10-year-old like she would have been, and John Smith, who's probably, I think, like 40 years old at this point. Now, how did all this play out with her original Aboriginal husband? Oh, yeah, they they don't talk about that. I think in the Disney film, he's dead. Yeah, someone kills him. In the Disney film, he he almost seems to be like the, the, the protector of the tribe or the warrior of the tribe. They don't really refer to him as the husband, I think. But, yeah. Uh, in the actual history, she was married. Um, she had no relations with John Smith, never. Uh, the only encounter I have that I had read about was John Smith was given quite a few women one night as bed warmers from the chief, and Pocahontas just was around. Whether or not a 10-year-old Pocahontas was involved in this possible orgy, I can't say, and well, I don't think anyone can. Would you have any scholarly information to back up were in aboriginal tribes were women of that age usually put in these type of situations or was there some type of tribal etiquette for for age for sexual um experiences 
depends on the tribe. We're talking about the, the Powhatans here. Uh, I wouldn't imagine they had anything against certain age groups being sexually active, but 10 years old does seem a little bit too young. I am in no way a scholar on the Algonquin, particularly. I, I work in a, a Mohawk native reserve, but uh, I would just go ahead, and I don't have the background to say that I don't think this would be the norm, but uh, certainly by the ages of 13, I, I'm sure that would be fine. Okay. And mind you, we know in native culture, the relations are a little bit different, especially the family structure. So it's a little bit more open as far as that's concerned when it comes to these relations. And mm -hmm. uh, on to Justin's question. She was married to this uh, this guy. Uh, later on, as I think it's shown in the movie, John Smith is injured. I can't remember in the movie how it's done. In reality, <laughs> gunpowder goes off in his pocket, apparently. And he's hurt quite badly. And he has to uh, be sent off to England to recuperate. And they think he's um, going to die, mind you. They didn't think he was going to make the trip back. But he did make it back. So in the meantime, the Jamestown goes into complete disarray. Uh, the natives' relations with the town go horribly. They try and let the settlers starve to death during a winter. And this leads the Jamestown colonists to try and wage a war, which they do. Uh, I think the villain, I forget what his name was in the movie. He was referred to as, I think it was John Radcliffe or something. John Radcliffe. John Radcliffe. Radcliffe. Yeah, he was actually a real person who was skinned and burned alive. I remember, he, I thought I had heard that he was tied to a tree and skinned and left there for days. But whatever, it was a gruesome death, mind you. Mm -hmm. uh, but this led to an interesting account where they went ahead and stole Pocahontas and brought her to England. I believe they even made a second movie involving this. Yes, they did. I didn't yes, see this movie, but yeah. And uh, this happened. And here, I'll go and show. We have a little picture here that my viewers can see of what Pocahontas looked like when they did a brief painting of her at the ripe age of, I want to say 15 or 16 at this point. I, I don't remember quite well. And uh, the reason behind this was they were going to use her status because she was known as a chieftain's daughter uh, for an alliance. She was married off to a John, oh my god, oh, I forget the name, it was John something, I believe. And uh, he had used her to try and form, uh, John Rolfe, he had used her to try and form some kind of alliance. They saw her as a monarchy-like figure, and... Uh, the whole reason was they wanted to grow tobacco like the natives were on the reserve. So they wanted to learn everything from them and to profit. And that was the whole purpose of John Rolfe's excursion later on. And later on, he allegedly poisoned Pocahontas to get rid of her when he didn't need her anymore. So it's actually quite a dark story. We chose this movie because it's just blatantly wrong. The stories don't really match up at all. And uh, nitpicking it would be difficult. You pretty much, it's a, you have an easier time of just summarizing the actual history because they just seem, they seem to go in a completely different direction. They have a romance between John Smith and a much older Pocahontas for some reason. And it takes up, I guess, most of the movie. Uh, everything is kind of, I don't know, misinterpretations on both sides that lead to strife. And then John Smith just sails off. Wow. But it made a lot of money for Disney. <laughs> yeah, and it, I suppose it is possible that she wasn't even, uh, I'm going to say, willingly keeping ties with John Smith. Maybe she was offered up to him instead, although we'll never know for sure. But it is possible as a peace offering. Yeah. Oh, and she was uh, captured, mind you. She was not willingly going to England. And uh, it was... The interesting thing I find is she did not seem to suffer any major ailments, yet died under mysterious circumstances, which gives a lot of credibility to the idea of her being poisoned. But that could also be just the historical accounts, especially from that time period. 
didn't really know much about the diseases coming back and forth. So it could be she died under mysterious deaths could mean she could have gotten any type of these diseases that maybe the people in London or England just didn't have any knowledge of. Particularly someone who's native traveling there hasn't been exposed to any of the pathogens that are floating around Europe at the time, which was, uh, there was a lot of nasty stuff coming out. Yeah, in both ways. Years, so. so it's, uh, there, there's a lot of possibilities and obviously yeah. we will the, never time know. the time period being what it is and the fact of her coming from a primitive or a more primitive civilization, I'm going to say, the record keeping probably wasn't the best. But uh, Well, they only could base everything yeah. on oral traditions, but oral traditions do come in handy. We, uh, we, we've done a lot in the recent years with uh, modern scholarly but If work. poor Pocahontas had just brought her selfie stick and vlogging camera, this would have been <laughs> settled already, but unfortunately yeah. she forgot it in her bag. So... No, I think if we move on to the next film we've chosen, we can dwell a little bit more into uh, the history. I know, Eric, we, we have quite a bit of a background in this, as we did take some of the similar history courses together. And uh, the movie is The Last Samurai, uh, starring Tom Cruise. You're all this was, uh, the, in terms of entertainment value, this was actually a really good movie. And for somebody watching it who isn't a historian... It might not be so easy to pick out uh, to pick out some of the errors in here, but basically what they've done with this story is mash two or three conflicts together into one storyline, and kind of loosely base Tom Cruise's character on a French soldier by the name of Jules Brunet. But uh, this story basically revolves around the Boshin War and the Satsuma Rebellion, all leading into the Meiji Restoration. So. I'll let you guys take it away. Let let me know exactly what uh, what's wrong with this one. Well, Eric, you can. Uh, Eric, well, why don't you I'm, educate us a little bit on a little bit of Japanese history and what kind of the time periods were we looking at here? Well, this was most notably around the Meiji Restoration period, which was a time after the Warring States period. From I just want to get these. Dates, the the Edo period. Yes. Work states. Oh, sorry. I, I mean, it, it, states was, I was thinking of a different point that I want to bring up later. It, with it was states. a warring states, kind of, yeah. But most notably, it was during this time you had the Daimo, and I'm sorry I'm mispronouncing it, but yes. Japan at this time was a constant infighting between these, what you could say, provinces that were always vying for control of Japan. Now, the Meiji Restoration is where the uh, monarchy of this place um, was able to take control away from the Daimo and create a central nationalized country in Japan. Well, we'll do mention the emperor was always, always there in Japanese history since his foundation. It's just but the power of the emperor symbolic, wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. It was a symbolic power because he had lost that power in, if I'm not mistaken, around the 7th century, where that's where the Daimo started taking away control and it became less decentralized. For those now, not for, familiar, a Daimo, think of them as like a shogun. Whereas, well, a shogun would be, he would control large territories, not just single Daimos, but kind of think of him as a prime minister in some ways. Now, for The Last Samurai, they are talking about the Meiji trying to, or the, the Meiji Restoration, where the Emperor is trying to uh, quash the last rebellion of samurai in Japan, which did happen, but not in the way The Last Samurai depicted it. As Justin r rightly said, it was a combination of many wars, not just this one rebellion under Mitsumoto, or not Mitsumoto, sorry for the mispronouncement nation, but it was Matsumoto. 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 Katsumoto, not Matsumoto, Katsumoto. Yes, as, yes, that's what I said. Which, to this date, I have been looking for information on this character, and I would come to the conclusion that he was a, a compilation character from actual historical um, figures from this time period. 
Now, what I was bringing up the Warring States before, like Justin said, this was a very entertaining movie. Like, and when I watched it, I enjoyed it very well. But historically, it's one of the most inaccurate historical films that I ha- I have seen. Most notably was the Samurai Rebellion. <laughs> that they were first of all wearing armor <laughs> from the Warring period, even yeah. though this at this time period it was the 19th century so this type of armor that's usually associated with samurai had not been used in actual battle for centuries it the actual conflict would have resembled you had one side which would be the imperial forces which did have that colonial uniform uniformity uh, uniformity whereas the rebellion they would have been using more traditional Japanese garbs like robes and stuff fighting and at the same time you see the rebellion using uh, katanas and bows and arrows when in reality they also had firearms because samurai had been using firearms ever since the Dutch brought it to them in the 16th century so that was probably the most noticeable historical inaccuracy of this film just face value Correct me if I'm wrong, but this film kind of goes out of the way to illustrate the fact that America modernized Japan's army. Exactly. <laughs> Where even though they had a small hand in it, it was mostly Europeans that in general, brought yes. Japan out well, of... There, there's, it's kind of confusing for American audiences because, yes, America did open up Japan with its gunboats uh, when Matthew Perry came over in 1854. It's true that they were the ones to open it, but this was an agreement between all colonial powers and all the other colonial powers are the ones that actually swooped in and did everything. Like the United States had a, a finger involved, but uh, f- compared to the others, no, not at all. Especially like France. The real reason why we have this character that Tom Cruise is playing is because he's a French officer. He's well recognized one at the time. And he, for whatever reason, decided to stay when all the French were told to leave when the Medjay restoration period was coming through because he believed he could influence a civil war to take it back because they had an agreement with france and this whole restoration period would break that agreement and they wouldn't get all the riches they were probably looking into but what i would say was shows a um describes japan was that one scene where one of the magistrate was talking with tom cruise's character and his super his supervisor about trading arms and he brought up the point that they don't need American arms, as in there was a German official in the next room, a Dutch official, and a French official. So this did represent that all these colonial powers were vying to get these contracts with Japan, because Japan was looking to modernize its army in that they wanted modern firearms. So it wasn't America, the sole country there, that was supplying arms. Japan was buying from everyone. Well, I mean, something to point out to people who might not be familiar is Japan was a closed society prior to 1854 because for quite a few hundred years, uh, they just decided to close all ports and they had limited trade with the outside world, except for the case of uh, Korea, some Chinese diplomats and, well, and the Dutch. They, they also, have, yes, the Dutch, thank you. The Dutch were Protestants, and there was a, a weird little funny rule where the only way you could go onto this small island beside Japan to do trading with them is if you walked over uh, religious, uh, a cross or pictures of Jesus, I imagine. And Protestants had no problem with this at the time, but you couldn't do this if you were a Catholic. The Dutch were Protestant. The Dutch were also notorious traders, as we all know. They were up and about trading all around the world, and they were trading firearms with the Japanese who had them for quite a few hundred years prior to this movie, where in this movie, it looks like they've never seen a firearm in their life. It's really ridiculous. Like they, The samurai, we'll call them samurai, have been fighting each other with firearms for a long time. This is part of warfare now. They weren't just going around with their old weapons. They were drastically and dramatically changed before these wars we're talking about. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the contradiction in the movie, too, going back to the whole training of the Japanese army. is, As Eric said, they, they did depict 
uh, the European officials trying to bid for the weapons contract. But then they would turn around and show a scene of Captain Algren training the Japanese troops and making an agreement to do so, saying they're not ready, teaching them how to shoot, how to reload everything. And the U.S. forces had very little had very little impact on this training. Uh, if anything, they would have wanted the opposite. They would have wanted the Japanese forces to be weak for their possible for their possible gains later. So it's a little bit uh, backwards the way they did this. Well, but what I would maybe not so much contradict, but the whole, uh, I would say, rookie nature of the army was in some way accurate because before um, uh, uh, Perry opened up the ports, peasants were not allowed to be in the army because under the Tokugawa era, it, they tried to restrict as much as possible peasants from having guns, even swords or anything. It was so the samurai and their people that were in charge yes. of military affairs. Peasants, what we would call the lower class, were not allowed in the military. And the Meiji Restoration completely destroyed the samurai class, got rid of it, and it made mm -hmm. a conscripted regular army, which would be low-paid peasants. And you're basically saying to your upper, I call them the knights, the noble class, you're irrelevant now. Your top tier position in our society is gone. And they, most of them were okay with this because they understood, you know, times were changing. But the ones that weren't okay with this did, in fact, have the rebellion. And it formed in the Boshin War, which is part of this movie, but also in the more famous rebellion of, uh, what was the name of the samurai? Satsumura? I believe Satsuma's rebellion, Satsuma, Satsuma's rebellion, and these two events were kind of molded into one, which makes this movie, even though they're quite a few years apart. And uh, Eric, I know that we haven't spoken about this yet, but um, the audience is, unless you specialize in Japanese history, you wouldn't really know much about this. But what a samurai actually was during this time period is not what people would think. Yes, well, that's what I find this movie really does. It plays to the stereotypes of the samurai like what a western person sees a samurai as and that of course as shown in this movie would be from the warring states period where you have that samurai in that tr traditional armor with a katana with uh, a bow being master um being a master archer but by this time since the tokugawa um, era there wasn't really any conflict in japan so the samurai started switching to more of a bureaucracy roles and such they started to lose that professional soldier aspect that they had now so, be, being that you're both very good with japanese history could one of you maybe explain what brought along this uh, this sort of pushing out of the samurai by emperor meiji uh, uh I because i don't i don't this, think yeah. it was very much of his own ideas i mean he was very young when he when he took power, he was only 14 or just on the eve of his 15th birthday. He was very young when he was brought into power. So, uh, you know, the movie kind of portrays the actual, it's a little complicated, but the actual history was by this time in the Edo period, samurais were a wealthy sort of land Lord. It was a feudal system, but they were just land owners with peasants and they were paid a certain amount of money. And, in their society, they had the highest tier, and there was not so much war going on by the end of the Edo period. And there was no room for other classes, but things had to be done in society. So there was a merchant class, a small one. Now, doing merchant stuff or being a skin tanner, for instance, in Japan is frowned upon. And there's actually slurs against you back then. Even to this day, being a skin tanner is this whole slur thing. So samurais couldn't do this. Merchants could. And what happens when you're a merchant? You start to make money. And when you start to make money, you have money to use. So they started to use their money by loaning it to samurais. And samurais were not particularly great with money. So they start to be in debt. So you have a bunch of merchants gaining unbelievable amounts of power over samurais and influencing the entire system. In the movie, you notice there's, I think, a, a Japanese guy in uniform. He's always talking to the emperor. I think he's kind of the embodiment of this because they began to take over the political scene. 
and they saw how the world was working because the Europeans came in, the Americans scared the hell out of the Japanese with their gunboats, and the Japanese realized, we're going to get colonized if we don't modernize. And that rhymed. Mm -hmm. To do so, they had to make an entire system look exactly like the rest of the world. They built grand monarchy, they made all these balls, they dressed like in the whole penguin outfits with the gowns, like European style, invited the royal families. They had this elaborate whole scheme so that they would look so modern that they couldn't be colonized. This meant they had to get rid of a lot of their traditional samurai class and all that background stuff. Almost all the population was really cool with this. Even the samurai, they understood that there was just, it was inevitable and they tried to mm. get their way in. So an adapt or die type of situation yes. mixed, yeah. mixed in with a little bit of with a little bit of financial instability. Yeah. But people need to realize when they watch this movie, the samurai, I, I don't I know how to sugarcoat this, more or less were dicks. They were a really oppressive class before all this, and they were abusing their power and just forcing people. They, they, they would abuse the peasants and do horrible yes. things. They were no way... Uh, you know, it's an open rebellion against the government, but the government wasn't really in the wrong. These rebels, they wanted to just take power like they always had. And this movie really, it puts on, you know, and you see it with, we have an American figure, and he looks back at this fantastic war under General Custard against the classic racist stereotype of the noble savage, the Native American, he's a noble savage. We all know this literature. But then they're pitching it against the samurai, and they keep making this contrast with this spiritual samurai, which isn't representative of at all the time period, and then the noble Native American. And they really keep stressing this with the flashbacks Tom Cruise goes through. And I remember you know, he, he does these horrible things to natives and probably Cherokee under custard or whatever they were trying to pitch over there, which I, I think it works with the timeline, but it's just, it's so unrepresentative of actual Japan at this time period. Yes. Now, I, I would also like to bring up the point of the conscript army, professional army. And as you said, it, this time period, it was adapt or die for Japan. So they were modeling their military now after European militaries. And for the last century and a half, European militaries um, started doing conscript peasant armies, you could kind of say, whereas you take the lower class people, you can pay them if a, they small, live. Yes, a small <laughs> moderate wage. But what made them really like this good strategy was because you can take them, you can train them how to use a musket or a rifle in a few months put them in a uniform and then send them off. And then because you're using a low class population, which is the largest proportion of your population, you have an abundant supply of what are essentially professional soldiers. Now that is why Japan started using peasants in their army because they, that was the most abundant class in their society. Yeah. yeah. So that's also why you see resentment from the samurai because for the longest time the samurai were the elite soldiers they wore the uh soldier class and, and now you would have oh yeah here. now yeah. you would have okay sorry hey. go ahead go ahead my you bad go i was well, gonna say i was just about to say damn Okay, now I'll just finish this last point. Yeah. I was saying that's why you have the samurai who are now resentful because now you have these peasant soldiers which are essentially doing the same thing they used to do, which was be the professional soldiers. And that's where this resentment from the samurai came from during that period and why you see these rebellions because you see peasants being put on the same level as samurai in the military aspect. I was now, just going to say that it's... was my point. Not it's not only resentment. The samurai, for hundreds of years, have been abusing a certain class of people mm -hmm. and keeping them under their foot. And then this class of people suddenly are not under their foot anymore. And if you think that these people who got conscripted and were gaining more political power weren't going to go after the samurai, you have another thing coming because the samurai they got what they deserved. And it it's a little bit apparent in the film when you see the relationship between those that are on the side of the government looking down and being kind of malicious towards the samurai class. I think there's even an instance where they cut one of the yes. guy's hairs. Yeah, like that kind of embodies it where they're... 
I mean, the movie does a poor way of showing it because it's the opposite. You see, you see this poor guy. Basically telling them yeah, their, their nobility's gone. Yeah, yeah. It's the but peasants exactly are going after the is. knights. You know when you and think about also... it... Sorry, Eric, go ahead. And I was just about to say... Um... Oh, shit, I forgot my point. You say what your point is, Justin, I'll come back to mine. <laughs> Well, you see, it's, it's it's very much for those who are still a little, you know, kind of shaky. It's it's almost a very similar conflict. You know, if you have union workers in America or in Canada who are either laid off or on strike, and then the companies start bringing in scabs and temp workers to replace them. And this causes huge revolts because basically you have educated, higher-end paid workers who are now obsolete and gone. And then you have lower class people who are replacing them, basically saying, well, we're going to do the same thing, same job, but we have none of the credentials to go with it. And it ends up causing this huge conflict for basically, uh, I'm using the term employment loosely here, but for basically yeah. that, the, the, the person's role in society has basically been made obsolete and has been pushed to someone farther down the chain. And they've just simply been brushed to the side. So, but and also I can understand their resentment there. Um, also, another um, probably resentment for the samurai would be that these soldiers were now loyal to the emperor instead of to his daimyo, because it was now it was a centralized national government, and the government was paying these soldiers. It wasn't the samurai like in a, the feudal Japan where you had samurai paying their retainers and that. Yeah, it's, this is true. true. This is so true. yeah, I, I like. I think we really delve deep into this one aspect of the Last Samurai, where it's the stereotypes portrayed in this movie were a very Westernized stereotype of Japan, and does not reflect the reality of the society of that time in Japan. It would it would be interesting to see a version of that movie made from the Japanese perspective. And see it, that exactly, and I'm sure if we actually looked into it, I know Japan's um, they probably have a cinema few. has a lot, lot of these type of films during their uh, uh, pre-European era type. So there's probably a few films out there on this time that show a more accurate depiction of uh, um, Japan. Yep. Yeah. So uh, do we want to dwell in the next film we chose? Because it's a good one. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's about time to move on. We've done yes. pretty well with that. I, I, and I happen, to, I happen to know that this next movie is a favorite punching bag for the two of you. Uh, so ooh. next we're going to be talking about The Patriot, starring mm. Mel Gibson. Uh, classic, classic movie and loved by many, many people. But I have a feeling most of these people are not History buffs. Well, uh, I just want to say about resentment. I actually like this movie, but oh, it's, it's a for guilty the most, pleasure. No, like it was my reason I like it is like the smallest little details that I thought were done very well, but probably no one else noticed. And in reality, it doesn't add anything to the film. I just thought it was very accurate and I just want to get it out. It was the depiction of the British army where you see throughout the battles and all that if you actually look in the background you see large amounts of african americans depicted in the british army from both of the major battles in this movie and i personally thought that was done very well because that was very accurate for the to british the war yes yeah there was the because what sh the patriot which what upset me was because the patriot was talking about you know slavery and how you know um I forget the two characters' names, but you had the slave who was getting his freedom, and the um, yeah the, the colony listen, side yeah. were uh, advocating to give freedom to the African Americans, which in reality was quite the different. But he offered to pay them too. Yeah, which didn't really happen. But it was oh. the British in reality who were taking on large amounts of slaves, granting them their freedom to fight in the British army, and then paying them. And uh, I th we should probably mention the audience. All three of us are not just Canadian. We're all from Quebec. So, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. Because I know anyone watching this who's American probably has a lot more history under their belt because they're taught this in high school thoroughly. But we are going to bring up probably maybe some nitpick items that they don't know about. 
when we talk about mm -hmm. the the history behind the American Revolution, we're not going to delve too deep into it because I'm sure Americans are exhausted with it. But we have there's some differences when we're taught it in Canada, and maybe there's some things that aren't talked yes. about so much. Okay, so yeah, I say well, let's delve into um, delve into yeah, the Patriots. I, I, I think Craig can dive into this one while I go and get a drink and let us know exactly what you think is a little bit off or right on the money for this. One. Okay, the entire movie. Uh, this next one. <laughs> Uh, I know Eric will. I'm gonna leave some of the more prominent battles to you, Eric, because this is we we both know the subject so well. But uh, let's talk about the issue of the British and the Americans and how they're interpreted in this film. The only way to describe most of the British in this is if they were running a concentration camp in Nazi Germany and they were all SS officers, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. You look at the yes. main protagonist uh, based off of uh, Tarleton. I think they called him Tavington in this film. I don't know why they changed mm -hmm. the names. And uh, he's evil, kills women and children, as British officers were known to do to uh, shoot the subjects under the crown. They're not people, I guess, to them. And uh, to then burn the women and children and villagers within a church. Yes. That one scene was probably the most yeah horrific depiction of the american revolution i can definitely say because it really shows that you had on one side the british and then you had let me uh, use a modern term the americans on the other and it was the british coming in and were butchering americans left right and center which was a terribly historically inaccurate depiction of this it wasn't a revolution the best way to depict the american revolution was a civil war where you had loyalists on one side and then what you could say patriots on the other you're gonna have a lot and, of americans pissed off right now when they hear these words but <laughs> if i know but if you actually look and study this time period you'll see it's almost a 50 50 divide in the population for the american revolution and being a loyalist doesn't mean you are you know a monarchist you love you would love the king and, you know, the crown and that. No, it was just you might have disagreements with the British Parliament, but you still saw it beneficial to stay in the yeah. um, um, the British Empire. You still saw yourself as a British subject. Mm -hmm. You're just saying, yes, our government, like, look at modern times. Um, how many people, you know, get pissed at their own government and say, oh, you know, I, I hate this guy or I hate this woman and that. But in, but you're not going to say, oh, you know, well, I'm not for our case. I'm still I'm still Canadian. I don't like my government at this moment. But mind you, you're I'm, saying this right now. And I can I can think of a few people in the United States who uh, don't like their president and say that he's not my president. But we won't go into that. <laughs> but do but would they still not consider themselves? Well, I don't like him. And because he's the head of my government right now, that means I'm not American. No. And that brings up with the, the Patriot and what it's really annoyed me about this was it shows that you were either American or you were British, British which was horribly wrong because that's not the reality of what this conflict was. But uh, to go on, I know we were talking about Taverton and his character and well, they call him the butcher and that, but it was only because of at a certain engagement while he was in the British Army, him and his cavalry unit um, were reported to have killed 200 Americans who were trying to surrender. But there was no actual historical evidence to prove this. Whoa, 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 the, wait. Because uh, there, there, there are two stories, and the ones that Americans the, are told in school is not the same one that the British and you know they're going to give us yes we have to explain there's two stories about what that's was the, known as the Tarl was... like the Tarleton Quarter at the Battle of uh God what was it called Ha Ha what Waxhaw the Waxhaw Battle yes but I like I was saying Warsaw? I know yeah it was the Battle of Warsaw and uh, the winged huzzas <laughs> actually finished off the British <laughs> after they saved the Americans um yeah no what what I was um. I was about to bring that up. You had one side where it's, the, if you say the American side, which was saying you had these Americans trying to surrender to the British. And then in a bloodlust of battle, Taverton and his men cut down 200 of them relentlessly. But on the other side, you have it saying, no, what was happening was it's what's the midst of battle. And yes, 
Americans, some Americans were trying to surrender, but at the same time, Taventon himself was hit by an American, and which gave the impression that they were not surrendering and were continuing to fight, and that's what led this British unit to continue to fight. So, well, here I've, I have one thing to say. Uh, Tarleton himself wrote, of course, of this because he did not die, like the movie depicts. Mm-hmm. He wrote himself that his horse got shot. He fell down. He was unconscious, and that his men viewed this. Well, the the green dragoon or the cavalry saw this. They thought his their commander had just been killed. So yes, they went and they attacked, and they were quite angry. I will note it is a bit of a cop out. The British guy says that he was unconscious and then all this horrible stuff happened i I, that is curious but on the american side the american i think was a physician that saw this he has this elaborate story where oh a musket ball just suddenly hit tarleton when they were surrendering and whoopsie doopsie and then all of a sudden they killed everybody in a blood rage but i don't think even the numbers prove that (laughs) so yeah i would say it's probably more of a in the middle of those two stories is what happened it's probably you had a group of Americans that were trying to surrender. And at the same time, you had another group that were still fighting and all that. And, you know, in war, it's hectic. A battle is like it's chaos. And so there was probably some were, some who were trying to surrender were cut down by these cavalrymen at the same time where others were still fighting were also cut down by these British. So... It's really hard to say the true extent of Tavinson's story, but it's definitely not what each story says. It's not the radical to the left or the right that yeah. is historically depicted. I actually have an interesting point to make. Uh, Justin. Yes, the, sir. Mel Gibson, based off of don't think anywhere towards the history, what did you think of Mel Gibson's character, the father and the children, all that? Mm. I mean, that depends on what you're asking. Are you asking if it was over the top? Are you asking if it was... Seemed like a good guy, kind of hero, great American. I mean, I guess obviously from a U.S. standpoint, that's what they were trying to portray, but I I assume you're just going to kind of mention the fact that his character was actually a bit of a nutcase. It's he well he was based off of and I don't know people will argue he's based off of Francis a Francis Marion yeah. no yes he's based off of a accumulation of a few revolutionary characters this isn't completely true there was an original script I had to read into this and he was solely based off Francis Marion the swamp fox <laughs> and the Americans might be taught some things about this character but. As people from Quebec in Canada, we learned about the French-Indian Wars. And this character is talked about a little bit. And he is, let's say, of a certain persuasion to doing horrible atrocities, not by our standards today, but by the standards of their time. He raped his slaves relentlessly, beyond the normal amount that was done at that time, mind you. And he went out of his way to participate in performing atrocities upon the Native Americans. And you might be saying, well, at that time, that's what happened. No, like, I mean, he really, they've written, he went out of his way. He was apparently a a psychopath, and he really enjoyed torturing and mutilating Native Americans during the French-Indian War. And he really took a good amount of time doing so. And he was a big time slave owner which i think in the movie was not quite what was depicted eric yeah this whole family man and you know he wanted nothing to do with war and in you know how the movie starts off is he wants he does not want war he will do everything but go to war and it was the british in their tyrannical um sense that murdered his son and which caused him to go fight for the Patriots because now he had a cause to end this tyranny. Well, I believe was... what turned the ties was SS Stumbanführer Tarleton had brought <laughs> yes. one of his kids to a camp. And that's when it started the, the gunship. Yeah. Yeah, like. It, it was really like over the top. Like, I understand it being a movie and they're trying to grab that sentiment 
you know, to show, you know, how just angry the um, the Patriots were, you know, how tyrannical England was that they had to fight. They had to fight for freedom. But it was just it went over the top on so many ways, like Pro- prominently to, the church burning, I think, was. Yes, sort of the worst. that was. Honestly, I felt like that, that was, was pretty just, bad. Yeah. yeah, and it's based off an actual event. If you think about it in history, there was that uh, thing I read about. It happened in France where the Nazis did burn uh, a mm-hmm. village of women and children, some people in a church at uh, Olodos or Glan. That's what I'm seeing over here. In my little notes I wrote. That that pronunciation was fantastic. Yeah, I, I but, almost uh, didn't want to. I we're, mean, we're we're gonna write some of these up on the screen so that. Uh, Poor Craig doesn't have you Googling stuff in Klingon <laughs> later. <No>. But, uh... <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like we've really been shit-talking this movie. Maybe let's try and well, here, uh, maybe get one something thing... good about it. <laughs> the, you know, the actual history of the movie, how it's depicting the large-scale wars. I think, Eric, you can go into uh, how it's depicting the whole Cornwallis, George Washington, North and South thing. Because mm-hmm. it, it's completely reversed. <laughs> Uh, because I mean, it, in the yeah, in the movie yeah in the movie you you're alluded to that uh george washington he's kind of against the ropes and he's being chased by a uh, british army in the north while in the south cornwallis has apparently he's just winning all the battles and then the militia come in and then they turn the tides at the very last battle where cornwallis himself is present and uh when <laughs> when the, well yeah historically if you want to say the americans in the south were fighting militia style because their whole washington's strategy at this point in the war was to prevent cornwallis from bringing his army to the north and finish him him, him off because the british had two armies. You had the northern and the southern. Cornwallis, of course, was in charge of the southern. Now, it was under uh, General Green that they came up with this idea of, you know, militia fighting, but it didn't mean that their whole army was based out of militia. No, it just meant that the army was always on the run and it was using militia to constantly keep Cornwallis occupied in the south, which the movie. Well, the events that were happening were not historically correct. The sentiment was correct in that militia was used because most of these militia were um, where you're in like South Carolina and all that were in these marshy areas and were hunters and that and were very were very accurate with the limitedly accurate, the limited accuracy of the rifles of that time. Now, during the battles, like when you actually had full-scale battles, which was rare because the American generals never wanted to go into actual open conflict with the British because um, British redcoats would... Destroy them. Yes. But when it did happen, you did not have militia, like, making up the center of the line or something like that, you know, holding key points. They're the whole army in this movie. There was the militia yeah. were being supported well, by the Continentals. They do, <laughs> they do show Continental troops... In battles, but I believe I don't know which battle is, but the very first battle you see, like you see the Continentals fighting the British and then just absolutely getting massacred by the British, <laughs> yeah. which I mean, during this time period, casualties were not as depicted as it was in the movie. In the movies, you're seeing thousands of soldiers dying in each of these battles, which was not accurate at all. I mean, if I remember looking at a number a long time ago, you might have actually only had 8,000 casualties throughout the Continental Army throughout the whole war. Like, it was not a bloody conflict. Well, it was actually more so that just back then the numbers were not that high when it came to casualties because it was still yes. gentlemen's warfare in, in an essence, mm-hmm. uh, except for probably Francis Marion, who I, I assume was just cutting people open probably <laughs> i mean God, i have no idea what he was doing in the the swamp being the swamp fox well i, I would say their depiction um after the first battle of when uh the colonel who i uh i would f- uh, forget his name but the american colonel who takes over the southern army the whole depiction of 
him saying how Green and his cabinet have fled and are running away was actually true because Green did, after losing uh, systematically to Cornwallis, lost all faith in the campaign and then blitzed out of the whole conflict. Yeah, it was the Battle of Cowpens, I believe, where yes. they were turning things around. And it, I, I think this movie doesn't necessarily show that battle properly, but the last battle they show is representative of how Cowpens was the big turning point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was true. Like the, the very when they show Cornwallis's surrender, that actually was and very as much as you can get in a movie historically correct, where you did have the Americans and the French surrounding. Cornwallis but did Cornwallis surrender for the entire British but that's yeah that's where the problem it was he merely surrendered his His, army yeah and he was yeah just gonna promise I'll go away for a while blah 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 you know mind you you're mentioning you know I'm surprised that they even had the French in the film because it's ridiculous they 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 still underscore like how much the French were helping in all this Yes, that's a that's actually a great point to bring up. The fact is, yeah, the the French played a huge, huge part for the Americans in the war. Not only were the French supplying the Americans with arms and munitions and that, but when the French sent over their naval fleet, they really did. They, you know, England had a um, uh, what would I say? You know, been known for its naval power, but in this conflict, the French actually beat. The British, because Cornwallis was trying to leave Yorktown with his army, and there was a British fleet sailing to him, and it was the French fleet yeah. that turned them away. So essentially, you can say that the French Navy um, saved the Americans, I guess, because where this, yeah, where like hypothetically, we can't really say what would happen if Cornwallis got away, but it's knowing the British attitude, they were. It was only a matter of time before the British gave in because they were losing heart in this conflict. That like, they knew that they probably couldn't win in the long run, and it was Cornwallis signing this treaty was just like the straw that broke the camel's back, and the British decided that it's uh, not worth their time to continue this engagement. I'm actually just realizing, Justin, are you still alive? <laughs> no, Justin is still here listening intently. This is. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, one of the periods that I'm not particularly okay. familiar with. Well, okay, I'll, I'll say this: like, I think we could probably go on and talk about oh, this yeah. movie for a long time. And I'll, I'll just close my statement saying, where being historically accurate, this movie was com- all around for the most part just wrong. But it did it grabbed that sentiment that you know the Americans wanted freedom or. Um, or half of them Getting. wanting to be loyalists yeah. and then becoming Canadians. That's why we're here today. Yes. Amer- Americans, if you don't know, um, kind of the birth of our country is a little bit from the loyalists. They made it up is. most of our population. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. But so, yeah, I would say like the movie, it has a sentimental moments which grab you. And yes, it does show the conflict. Like the actual battle scenes Are good. were, on a sense, very accurate. It was just the whole... You know, all of America versus this tyrannical, like you said, Nazi England was very historically inaccurate. Oops. But I think, uh, Craig, what are your final uh, thoughts on this? Um, was happy to see that they went through the efforts of trying to change the names of characters because they, they butchered Francis Marion and Tarleton by how they depicted them. The I didn't appreciate... I mean, what, what are you going to do? You make an American movie, yes, you're going to make the British look like Nazis, but, like, the burning of women and children in the church, really? Really? Uh, other than that, interesting that they gave, you know, a bit of film to show that there was French involvement, as there was. Uh, could have shown a little bit more about George Washington in the North. Even though they completely blundered that story, George Washington had basically pin down the British. British weren't leaving New York to go fight him. It's not that he was running away. They could have actually like boosted morale of the audience. Like, yeah, George Washington's doing good. But instead, you just hear about him briefly. There could have been more there. But it is a movie. You can't do everything. Uh, Justin, you have anything to say about the movie? Well, I have to say it's nice to hear about the French supplying the U.S. with arms for once. That was uh, 
you know, that, 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 that was a high point for us, I should say. But, um, no, it's, uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting period where you have so many of these crazy characters like Francis Marion, who in essence is completely nuts, but still managed to at least play an important role in this and backing oh, off. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as much as I was belittling his character and calling him a psycho, he was a necessary psychopath to win the revolution. His, yeah, his was, guerrilla warfare. Yeah, yeah. Like he, the the whole swamp fox thing and how they were going about. I'll call it the dirty war. How they were being involved in this dirty war. They are were a significant part of winning this. And he was cunning. He was very intelligent. He was. No, yeah. They yeah. this movie did a very well job of showing that guerrilla war style. That was actually very accurate because that's how they were fighting they were using cool. ambush style um tactics to keep the british pinned down because if you're using guerrilla warfare a standing army will then have to readjust to that and what happens then is like you see those british forts in the movie the army stays in these forts because it can't risk sending these parties out into the countryside mm-hmm. if they're just going to keep getting ambushed so literally you are pinning down these british armies with guerrilla so i would say the Patriot did do a good job at representing that. Yeah, in in that respect, it sh- it sort of showed how the the, the victories aren't always pretty. But yeah. Uh, yeah. war is never easy, nor is it fast. <laughs> well, exactly. But uh, you know, I so we'll move on to the next movie because I know this one's a real uh, it's a real outlier. Uh, 300, oh. the sequel, uh, Rise of an Empire, to which yeah. empire is risen in the film, we do not know. Cause like, yeah, I don't think this one's going to take long. I yeah, mean, I mean, we'll, we'll get Justin, your impersonation, uh, upon seeing this film, what you thought. I'm sure you, you can say a few um, things. This is Sparta. <laughs> That's I, the first uh, one. <laughs> well, no, the Spartans I, I, were in it. But, but sure. let's in the second one, they were... Anyways, yes, go on. I mean, look, you know, talking about Artemisia, you know, she was very, very prevalent in that time in terms of her position of power and her her idolization. Everyone looked to her. uh, She was an advisor to Xerxes. Um, Sorry, she provided. uh, I'm sorry, I'm choking on myself here. (laughs) It happens to me all the time. I should have drank before this. Uh, well, you know. So she provided five ships to the war effort and uh, basically advised Xerxes. Oh, my goodness. I can't even. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, Craig, take over. I'm dying here. <laughs> you know, she, she's talked about in ancient, ancient sources. We're going to go back to uh, our favorite, the father of lies, Herodotus. Herodotus. I honestly think he was a little bit horny when he was writing this because he wrote a lot about her, Artemisia. She was uh, a royal queen of her her territory, and she did supply five ships of like the 400-something ships that they brought over. And yes, she was one of the counselors to Xerxes. Herodotus tells us he actually had quite a high esteem of her, allegedly, and listened to her, except for what is depicted in the film in the Battle of Salamis. Uh, but this film uh, begins with the very famous Battle of Marathon, where Darius and Xerxes are actually there, which did not happen. This is absolutely <laughs> false. And no, he was Darius was not killed by some Athenian from a beach. Like it was the weirdest scene. It was, oh uh, yeah, God. I mean, th- I thought 300 really, really nabbed at the history, but this one really went overkill. Yeah, I just gotta say, like, this movie, if you're seeing it, it is purely a entertainment piece. There is zero historical accuracy in it. Like, if you're going to see this, you cannot, anything you see in this movie, you cannot take it as being historically, any type of resembling historically accurate. No. It's just, they just use the names, and that's the only thing that's, like yes there was athens athens burnt down you had sparta yeah it was like all you can say that's accurate was usually 
the names of stuff in this movie was the only accurate thing. Other than that, if you're watching this, it, just take it for entertainment value. You you will learn nothing about this time period from it. I'll try and really speed this up. The 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 movie perpetuates actually kind of the Greek lies at the time where yeah. Oh, Persia is attacking us. Why was Persia attacking? The Greeks had attacked Persia and burnt down a bunch of shrines. That's what mm-hmm. actually happened in history. So King Darius, or Darius, if you want to pronounce it like that, said, oh, well, I can't let this go you know, un, un, uh, undone. So uh, I'm going to send the contingency of the military over to go punish them. And that's all it was. Greece was yeah. so minuscule compared to everything else in the world. No one cared about Greece. Darius really didn't care about Greece, but he just wanted to put them down. So we sent his armies, and we see the Battle of Thermopylae, which was shown in the first film, and then we see the Battle of Marathon that's shown here. The interesting thing is, while they were not defeated, the Persians were really not defeated. The Battle of Marathon, they lost a battle. And that's what really struck a chord when Darius heard about this. Darius dies. Xerxes takes up the cause. They have to go back and punish the Greeks for this. And this movie, we, we go and we see the Battle of Thermopylae again. There's flashbacks. But then we see what is called the Battle of Salamis. And this is another time that the Persians did lose a battle. The Persians did not really lose a war to the Greeks. They barely put a dent in the Persian army. It, it, honestly, to even call it a defeat, it's just it's a joke. Persia did take this on the chin, and Xerxes, I think, I don't even know if it's shown in the film, he did, at the request of his commander, was Artemis, Artemisia, said, you should just leave, let us take care of the rest in Greece. So he did, and he went back home. And Salamis happened, and it was a blunder, and yes, the Persians lost. What is kind of shown in the film is the land bridge that you saw in both films, which was uh, must have been an amazing thing to see in the ancient world problem yes. with all this for the Persians. Why all of this happened in reality? Having a land bridge meant that your army was coming into Europe, into mainland Greece, and then you were cut off from the other peninsula, Turkey and the rest over here. This meant that you had to have your navy present to protect the land bridge because if the bridge gets destroyed, you are stuck without supplies. And back home in Persia, they're going to revolt because they love rebellions. And yes, there was rebellions going on at this time. And that was a lot scarier than Greece to the Persian yes. emperor, Xerxes. Yeah. So he could not afford to be stranded for too long, mind you. This is all a timing thing. He had to get back home. So their navy did have to go fight this little battle of Salamis. And mind you, as was kind of shown, in, I think, in the first 300 film, they lost a lot of navy coming over here to storms already in the first place. They could not afford to keep up the land bridge after they lost their na- well, a lot of their navy at the Battle of Salamis. That's why they had to leave in the first place. That's why they left. They didn't really lose a war. They just couldn't afford to be there. It was too scary of a situation to be stuck in Greece. They would have burnt Athens a third or fourth time if they were still there. <laughs> the Greeks really didn't have much of a chance. They only later, I think it's shown in the film, won a significant battle, which is the Battle of Plataea, when the Spartans led all the other free greek city states to fight for some kind of weird democracy they're trying to show as if the spartans care yeah, about democracy <laughs> that's what that's the point i just wanted to bring up too like both of these movies you have athens preaching freedom you know we're fighting for freedom we're and which was for america completely yeah that's exactly there's this whole western idea of we're fighting for freedom the the reason the greeks and to be fair most of the greek city states actually sided with the persians, persians. because the the Persians offer were really good. Thebians. But what, Always yeah. the Thebians. What the Athens and Sparta, which were the two big ones, were really fighting for was self determination. They wanted to be able to rule however they wanted. They wanted if they wanted to have a monarchy, they wanted they should have be able to keep a monarchy. If they wanted to have what the Athenians called a democracy, they wanted to be able to choose that. Even though the Persians in their offers said you can rule however you want. You just have to pay homage to the Persian king. There was no fight for like a unified Greece or this whole I- ideology of we're fighting for Greece and you know freedom. You'd have, every city state would be like, I'm fighting for 
me for Corinth, Athens people. We're fighting for democracy in Sparta. We're fighting for our slaves. But yeah, that's what I was saying. Like it, it, like I said, this movie was a pure entertainment piece. It's there is no shred of factual historical evidence. And, and I, I know, like we, we, yes, we can present the Persians as kind of being the bad guys, but they're not they're, they're not really the bad guys if you look if you actually yeah. look in I, we can't talk about this on this podcast but it'd be interesting to actually if you took the persians point of view of this entire war you'd be like huh yeah they had a lot yeah. of grievances and they had reasons to attack the greeks and the greeks are kind of dicks yeah. like they said there's two sides to every story yeah and these movies show a historically inaccurate one-sided story oh just so we should let justin know um artemisia didn't have sex with the diplomat (laughs) for the athenians themocles themocles she didn't oh no No. historically you know shocker you know oh and he didn't represent (laughs) all of greece mind you which he seems to in this movie he was just one of the commanders from athens but (laughs) oh and the persians didn't have like um i don't know a few hundred thousand ships like like a sea of ships attacking this small contingent and then at the end of the film the spartans come the spartans were there the entire time with their measly like 10 ships the spartans yeah. didn't have much of a navy it was, at that time it was a joke yeah exactly thanks for clearing that up guys while i was dying slightly but uh appreciate no. you covering for me just, we can speed this up along because I know people need. We're actually filming this uh, around dinner time, I guess. So we kind of want to speed this yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. The yeah, last that's fine. Well, I think we can go into the last one, which is uh, Black Hawk Down, and I'll start this one off since Ooh. you guys uh, covered for me on the last one. So basically, uh, this movie revolves a lot around uh, conflicts and the uh, Somali Civil War, which was happening in the late '80s, early '90s. Basically, a struggle for power. And uh, which led to the U.S. and the U.N. getting involved. Um, basically, there were military juntas led by a man named, just to pronounce this horribly, Siad Bar, uh, in 1988-1990. Eight, eight, and uh, in 1990, basically, there were Somali forces engaging armed rebel groups, all struggling for power. The issue is is that the U.S. and U.N. uh, wanted to try and mitigate the amount of... uh, Holy crap, I can't talk today. Sorry, guys. Uh, And now I lost where I was was looking at my notes again. (laughs) Well, basically, at at this time... Sorry, I found it. Yeah, the U.S. and U.N. wanted to alleviate the human suffering uh, that was happening. They had sent in originally Red Cross and non-military troops which began to be attacked or pushed back, which is when the U.S. and U.N. decided to respond. Um, Craig, you can probably tell a little bit more about the military actions that led after that. Well, the best and easiest way to describe this film is to describe the history because it does it phenomenally. It's almost exactly the same. There's very little wrong with the historic accuracy of this film. I'm not going to talk about I know this, there's a lot of backlash about racism and all sorts of other things and the depictions in this film, but as far as the history is concerned, it's actually pretty much on the dot. There's just minor differences with characters if you want to nitpick. Um, so the background information, as Justin said, it's a humanitarian effort in Somalia. This is a terrible time in the world. In the early 90s, we were going to see Rwanda, we're going to see Bosnia and the genocides, and this was just another cupcake on top of that, especially for the United States. UN comes in, UN does what UN does best, tries to sell medicine, causes more harm than it should, and has to get the United States to clean up after them. So people are starting to get attacked by the Somali rebels who've recently taken over the government, overthrowing it, and they're all fighting for power. So we have a civil war that now is a worse civil war with warlords that are coming in, and one of them is the predominant Farah Adid who uh, had rebels in the south won't go into the history of it it's a lot but he was the big warlord that we're seeing in this and the united states gets precedent and sends in a hell of a task force to try and take him out get rid of him and to pacify the area we'll call it 
So the actual battle, which is sometimes known as the uh, the Battle of the Black Sea or the Battle of Mogadish, was in 1993. The events of this film show October the 3rd, October the 4th, Black Hawk Down. How to go into this? UN organization in Somalia, UNISOM, was getting attacked, as I said. George W. Bush at this time period sent U.S. forces. This uh, we have the Rangers, we got Delta Force, Navy SEAL Six, other Marines. It's it's really it's, it's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's awesome that they're there. I'm sorry, <laughs> I love this movie. But anyways, not, not not the horrible atrocities that happened, but you know. Uh, in the actual history, two helicopters were shot down. This resulted in the ground forces being stuck. Rescue forces couldn't get there, you know, quick enough, and there was a gun battle. The Somali forces under Farah Adid had attacked the American forces, and I had in my notes how many we're seeing in the two days that they were fighting during the firefight approximately 300 somalis were killed hundreds wounded a total of 16 rangers were killed 83 wounded before the relief got in and that was the heroes that aren't really shown in this so much the uh, pakistani malaysians and there was other uh, european groups probably that helped because they were there but it's an american film so they're not going to be acknowledged as much minor little nitpick there and um, there is some discrepancies with the story because this is based off of a news reporter's account, mostly, of uh, all the events uh, back when news reporters were actually telling real news. I just got to say that one. And uh, the movie, it's pretty realistic as far as I'm concerned. It's a well-documented event, documented event, and uh, the gunfire is awesome in this movie. The Somalis, um, the actors aren't actually s- Somali. They're just actors from other places and i heard that there was a big backlash when this film came out and that they didn't feel that they were representative because like the language wasn't the same and they didn't look like somalis because not all africans look the same and uh, i can't speak as far as that i mean it's hollywood they did what they had to and i heard there's a lot of racism involved and the depictions just you know it's a war movie. What did we expect? Well, when you... well, the movie itself, you know, the the one point I wanted to bring up is the movie itself is told obviously from a very American standpoint, and you know, talking about your Battle of uh, Mogadishu, uh, many Americans or many people refer to it as the first Battle of Mogadishu, mm-hmm. and that's because there was actually nine or ten major battles that happened in that area uh, during the time of the Somali Civil War. But obviously, this was the only one that the Americans were majorly involved in. So, of course, this is the one they picked to make a movie about. You know, and it was a very heroic a heroic time for the Rangers trying to get the support in and get them out after the choppers were shot down. But uh, there, there were many, many major battles that played, uh, that played a hand in this civil war. And, you know, obviously this is the one that the movie depicts, but it's, it's, it's not historically inaccurate. It just doesn't tell the whole story. It's, uh, it's a little bit lacking. Obviously, it's a movie. They can't include everything. So I had to do a little bit of research because I wanted to try and nitpick this movie because it is known as quite a historically accurate film. And I, I did find there were some things that are allegedly wrong with it. Um, the relationship between the Delta Force that are shown and the Rangers as far as the news reporter who wrote the book uh, that this was based off of, he said that the Rangers were actually quite young and inexperienced compared to the counterparts of the Delta were the vastly more experienced forces compared to them. And that this led to um, a lot of Delta Force members not listening to any officers in the Rangers' orders and they're being insubordinate. And this isn't really shown in the film too much i think it you, you feel it a little bit but this overall feeling between the two groups isn't really shown and this they're all shown to be quite professional which of course they, they, they were but they could have i guess shown that the rangers were a little bit less inexperienced they're a little bit greener than the delta and um some people that actually were involved in this event had some things to say about the movie i uh, have a little note here i read general Preveras. Masharaf claims the film did not credit the work done by Pakistani soldiers and Malaysians. 
So what he is saying is that they had a bigger influence in these events and that they felt that they weren't shown as much. But it's, it's yeah, like you said, it's an American film. And this event, this two-day event was really an American story in a lot of ways. Uh, and I had, uh, yes, the backlash I had already mentioned. The Somali act, there was no Somali actors. It was actors from other parts of Africa. The language didn't fit. So if you were Somali, you'd be kind of scratching your head saying, well, that's not at all the language. And they don't look like us at all. So that it's a little nitpick there and uh what else but oh you you'd say overall it still was they they really tried to represent yes the event historic most historically as possible but like anything it's a movie and movies will always use of course like you know dramatic extent to you know create a better story for historical movies so you'll never get a 100 percent historical movie because no one would want to see that except for historians because most history is not really exciting or you know like a movie you have these like big climatic build-ups in throughout history everything's kind of just you know flows kind of at yeah, the same very pace. true very so, true so oh, that's why I, movies I just... always have to create dramatic effect and switch stories around a little to give a more entertaining viewing to the average person but yes, go on. I just realized, and of course, the, the only thing that actually looms over this film is there, there's very little information given at the beginning for why this is happening in the first place. Yes. And they, they kind of, yeah, they're amping it up to be, you know, kind of a little bit of a disaster in the Americans or the heroes. And that when truth be told, uh, it's, it's dirtier than it would seem. And I mean, it would take away from the narrative the film's trying to show with the you know, America saves the day. I, I don't know how, how else to put it. People can read into the history themselves. It's like any other engagement. You know, there's a lot in the Bosnian War you can read about and the Rwanda incident that's going on almost the exact same time. This is very much involved and influences those two events as well. It's not just a blunder for the UN. This was a blunder for the United States of America and they were overstepping their, their feet. But They were it? overconfident yeah. in their yeah. ability to... Um, manipulate events I, I i wouldn't even say manipulate but um well i mean uh, other than this event no the united states destroyed the civil well, they, they really put down all the other battles it was just this one event where the somalis got a, i'll say a lucky shot on them no they they pacified quite well comparatively as to what was going on before but mind you somalia is still i, I arguably in a civil war to this day <laughs> you could argue so yeah nothing really changes it's it's, uh, it's not a it's not a great situation. No, no, it's not. Um, well, I think we go. that yeah, I think pretty that's... much sums it up, unless, Eric, you had something you wanted to no, add. No, honestly, but, uh... I think we did a great job going over. I mean, I'm sure we probably mixed up a few historical facts or maybe went on a couple of tangents for too long. But overall, I yeah. think we did a, a very good job. For, yeah, if people uh, don't podcast. realize by us talking, we, we don't – this isn't scripted. We – we're just oh, yeah. this was tossing all... around. We're amateur amateur historians, we'll call it. This is just when historians have a few drinks or something, and they're just talking and throwing out those things. We can try and yeah. back up what we say, but we don't have the books in front of us. So I thought it would like be interesting. We, yeah, it was. Like you say, if we really wanted to, we could have done a real scripted academic podcast on, you know, where we research everything. But I feel yeah. this free flow, free flow, fun type podcast is a better way and then you know of course people can always comment where we got wrong tell us you know maybe things we might misinterpret and all that we're always up for we're historians we always love learning so we're always up to learn new things or where we might be wrong type things That's and hopefully we yeah. helped educate some people too on certain things they weren't aware of and by all means, uh, if you guys like this podcast and you'd like to hear another one, leave uh, leave comments or suggestions, yeah. movies you think we should pick apart and uh, kind of see. You know, we we have a list of a few possibles for the next one. But if there's any movies you guys would like to to get critiqued or picked apart or you know, or, or other things in history, fact checked, so to speak, then. Yeah. Uh, this podcast isn't solely for, 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 for movies. I just We chose this as a great... These yeah. are the first... I'm not even sure if I want to call these podcasts. These are discussions. I thought it would be interesting as a, a pilot to warm up and mm -hmm. talk about these things. Because it's something everyone can enjoy. And we're definitely going to go into deep dive scholar 
subjects with a lot of evidence in front of us later on. Yep. All and, right, then. Yeah. This is also part of my YouTube channel, so please, if you could help with a like and a subscribe, everything helps, you know. And uh, <laughs> Sell out. Sorry. Yeah. Did I uh, say but, that? What is your YouTube channel? Maybe uh, NBS History? <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> Actually, I think I have a little picture here. NBS you History. You will uh, put the link in the description below yeah, for of everyone. Course. And it'll be posted in. on my YouTube channel, of course. And this is my friend Eric and Justin. And they've been in videos before with me. And you will see them again. And yeah, thank you, everyone. It's a for pleasure. Listening. Thanks, boys. This and we'll catch you soon. Been everyone NBS have a good day. History, myself and my parrot say goodbye. Here we have